So grab a Bible, open it to Proverbs 13, which is where we are. And any particular time we gather together, we are traveling through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And it's been a blessing to us. Um, and we need to get a T-shirt. I was telling first service that says I survive Proverbs 13 um, <laughs> because it's been it's been rough. Remember last week we were together in verse 10 um, really checked us on our pride. Remember verse 10, it says, by pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well of eyes is wisdom. You can go back and listen to that um, online, but that is so true that we learn that we all have pride. And if we think we don't have pride, we, are, we know we have pride then. Um, and that pride causes so many issues. It prevents us from, from having good fellowship one with another. It even prevents us from being good witnesses of Jesus Christ to the lost. It gets in the way of so many things It divides and it, it causes so many problems. Um, and it, it does that in almost every relationship. And when we learn to humble ourselves before the Lord and check our pride, it's so much, so beneficial to us. And so we've been dealing with a lot of these things as we've been going through this particular chapter. But today, good news, we actually finished the chapter in first service. Ain't that amazing? We finished the whole chapter. So um, we picked it up in verse 13. We got down to verse 12 last week, verse 13 through 25. Let's read it and then we'll dive into it and uh, we'll make our way through. Verse 13 says, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one from the snares of death. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. The wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. He who walks with the wise man will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Evil pursues sinners, but the righteous good shall be repaid. But to the righteous good shall be repaid. Verse 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And we covered this one a few weeks ago, but we'll touch on it again today. But the wealth of the, of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor. And for lack of justice, there is waste. That's an interesting verse. We'll, we'll get into it. Verse 24, another verse we covered previously says, he who spares his rod hates his son but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. The righteous eats to the satisfying of his soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. And so, Father, we thank you today, Lord God, for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to us in a way that only you can, Lord God, that you would remove the things that hinder, whether it be the cares of this life or the distractions of this room or the work and meddling of the enemy. Lord, I pray that you would move all of that out of the way, that you would take this hour as your hour. Lord, that we may hear from you, that you would be able to speak to us. Lord, that we would be able to feast upon your word and grow from it. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And so if you're just joining us in this study, of course, Solomon, the writer, um, obviously the Holy Spirit is the author, but Solomon is being used, the human agent being used to write this. His intent is to, to write down instruction for his son, his children, uh, in fact. And Solomon being the wisest man in the world is writing these Proverbs based not only on what he's observed and seen in life, but also according to the wisdom that God has given him. And as he's going through this particular section that we're in, what we're seeing is these very short little proverbs mostly contrast with one thing and another often the wicked with the with the righteous and stuff like that and so these little contrasts are teaching us lessons and as we go through them some of them are very simple and we move kind of kind of through them swiftly others we may camp out at for a moment and glean and so that's where we have been and starting 
in verse 13, again, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. And that right off the surface seems to make sense. Anytime the word is being mentioned or even wisdom and knowledge, all of it here in the book of Proverbs is ultimately referring to, remember the purpose of the book, us receiving knowledge, wisdom, understanding from the word of God that we may apply it in our lives, right? We understand that. And so here, here he, he who despises the word will be destroyed. The word despises here in the Hebrew, it means to hold it in contempt or to hold it as an insignificant thing. Now, we would off the bat be able to say, well, amen, we know that non-believers maybe uh, hold the word as something that is insignificant and maybe even in contempt. And that's true. And we would say, well, that's something that's normally something we would see um, being uh, displayed within the halls of Congress. We've come to recognize that within the United States, for instance, you know, or, or maybe at the, U the UN or maybe a Muslim country or something, de despising the word of God or holding this, the Bible that we have as insignificant. But the reality is, and I'll get into it more, that this is now something that's impacting what we would think of as the, even the Christian church. As there's a move within the Christian church to push the word of God aside and to hold it in contempt and even insignificant because the word of God is standing its ground when many so-called pastors and even believers are beginning to move in their theology in the wrong direction. And, and, and in order to justify now them changing their positions in, on certain areas and doing things that are not supported according to the word of God, they kind of have to begin to, to uh, move it aside and, and re, if you will, interpret it and deconstruct and reconstruct and everything else that they're doing because they need to push, the, push away from the word of God. And so it says here that he who despises, he who considers it to be contemptible or even insignificant will be destroyed. The word destroyed is just to be bound and destroyed. It means what it says. But he who fears notice the commandment. The word fear here in the Hebrew, even um, maybe we use it differently in the English, but it means to see, to be reverent or to respect, or to have reverence for it or respect or even fearful. And fearful here means to be fearful in the sense of that we have such a respect for it that we don't want to go against it and we don't want to receive the uh, consequences of doing that. And so that's what it's getting at here. So he, he who despises or sees the word of God as being an insignificant thing will be destroyed. But the one who has a reverence and a respect for God's word will be rewarded. And even the word rewarded there, if you look it up in your Hebrew or if you use a strong concordance so you can see the Hebrew or the uh, Greek in the New Testament, um, it literally it means, which I didn't expect, it means to be in a covenant of peace or to be complete or sound. And I love that. In other words, he who has a reverence or a reverential fear of God's word will find themselves in a covenant of peace and they will be complete and sound. I love that because the Bible says in the New Testament in Romans, it says that now that we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, that we now have peace with God. And that's significant because prior to being born again, we didn't have peace with God. In fact, we were enemies with God, according to the scripture. But now that we're saved, we have peace with God. That's good news. Amen. So me and God are at peace with each other. Amen. I can say that because we read the rest of the scripture and we see the outcome for those who don't have that peace. So now that we have the have peace with God, we also have the peace of God in our lives. Jesus says, my peace, I leave with you. So we have this overwhelming peace, which really, if we remember, is one of the fruits of the spirit. Amen. So to have a reverential fear of God's word brings me into this 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 place of being at peace with God, having God's peace in my life. And I become sound and complete and, and, and thorough. Well, that's what Paul said to Timothy. He said that the, the word of God is, is God breathed. Remember, all, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof and instruction that the man of God may be complete, fully furnished, lacking nothing. Whoa. 
the Bible is saying that, man, to have this reverential respect for God's word just brings with it so much. It's like a supernatural thing that begins to take place in your life. And and this is what we need to understand. And it gets better because as we look at verse 14, he, he continues this same thought process by saying the law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. And I love this. And I'll come back to my previous thought in a moment. But the law of the wise is a fountain of life. What on earth is he getting at here? Listen, the, the law of the wise, the law, of course, applying the word of God, the law of the wise it's the wisest law because, listen, the wise person has received the law and adopted the law or has received the word of God and has adopted the word of God as his or her own in his or her way of life. And so now the law of God is literally has become the wise person's law as well because they have made it a complete part of his or her life. You know, people always like to tell you about how they live their life. And sometimes you, you hear this phrase, or at least I've heard this phrase. People like to tell me a lot of times, well, I'm the type of person who, and then after that, they want to tell you all about how, what their standard of life is and how they live their life, their principles and what they think, which amounts to nothing unless it's according to the word of God. But the wise person has adopted God's word as their way of life. Um, it has become a fountain of life to them, um, to those who, who have adopted it as theirs, as well as those who hear them speak. It's a fountain of life, meaning it's like a fountain of spring that never stops flowing. It always is flowing with, with fresh water, which prevents stagnation, prevents disease and bacteria from developing. When I'm talking about the natural streams that can be harmful and, and it continues to provide nourishment. In other words, the word of God has become a, a, a fountain of life in and of itself. Psalm 37, excuse me, Psalm 36, verse seven through nine says it this way. Uh, it says, how precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house and you give them drink from the river of your pressure, pleasure. And it says, for with you is a fountain of life in your light. We see light with you is a fountain of life. I love this. Um, Jesus said this in, in the Gospels. It was at the last Passover that Jesus attended. And it was um, in verse chapter, uh, John chapter 7. It's on the screen, verse 37 through 38. On the last day, that the, uh, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I love that. Referring to the presence of the Holy Spirit that comes into the life of the believer when we become born again. Jesus says in another place, he says uh, in John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak, Jesus is the living words. Jesus says the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Isn't that beautiful? So wait a minute, we become born again. God pours his spirit into our hearts. The Bible says he's poured the spirit of his son into our, into our hearts crying, Abba, Abba, Father. It's the spirit, Jesus says, who will lead you into all truth. He will take of what is mine and give to you. And so those who have been born again, who, all, who love the word, have this constant, both from the Holy Spirit himself and the flow of God's word through us, have this source of life with us at all times. Isn't that amazing? with us and from within. And it's beautiful. So what am I saying? Here it is, that when you fall in love with God's word, it has a transforming effect over your whole life. And you begin to feast upon it in a way that you never have. And it constantly sustains. It never gets old. It's living the word of God is living. Did y'all know that? The Bible says Hebrews, the word of God is living, it's quick and powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive. 
You know, it's alive. I mean, it lives. And so you feast upon it. It never stops giving you what you need. It's like um, uh, sustaining you and nourishing you every day. And so we find that those who fear it and love it, they will have this peace. And those who are, are wise, it is to them a fountain of life from within, constantly producing nourishment, direction, and what we need. And that's why Jesus was able to quote scripture to Satan that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I love those words. And Jesus says, man, look, we don't live by, by bread alone. We live by God's very word coming from his mouth. That's how we live. That's what sustains us. And that is true. And when you fall in love with God's word, you begin to recognize that and see that and even experience it in your life. So verse 14 says, the law of the wise is a fountain of life. But notice it says at the second part of this verse to turn one away from the snares of death because it's become a fountain of life. It's constantly producing the fruit of direction in your life to turn you away from the work of the enemy. Um, David says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. It is a light into my path, a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. Don't y'all love that? Especially here in North Carolina because you walk around and as it starts to get cool and the little copperheads come out trying to get warm on the sidewalks, you know, so you got to put your night lights out so you can see what's going on, you know? And I think about the word like that. You know, I grew up in the country. A lot of y'all come from the city and one of the one of the complaints y'all have is there's not enough light down here, you know, and I understand what you're saying, you know, because in the, in the country, you know, go outside at night, there's no light. And I think about that, man, God's word is a lamp unto my feet. It guides, it, it, it highlights snares of the enemy. It gives wisdom and the moment which I need it because he supplies it. All right. Verse 15. Y'all doing okay? We're going to move through some of these a little faster. Verse 15 says, good understanding gains favor. But the way of the unfaithful is hard. Um, I like that good understanding gains favor. And that makes sense. If you have good understanding, meaning good understanding through the wisdom of the Lord, you're going to gain favor. Um, that's what it says. In fact, the NIV actually says good judgment. I, I like that too. Good judgment gains favor. God teaches us how to have uh, understanding and good judgment in situations. And because of that, we gain favor, not just from God, but even from man. Stuff begins to work out as we operate according to the understanding of God's word. And you end up with favor. I think half of y'all in here going to work tomorrow. You know exactly what I'm talking about, Christian. When you begin to trust God and, and even though it ain't the way you want to handle something, you do it according to what God's word says and favor comes even on the job, doesn't it? Um, it notice it says here in the second part of verse 15, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. The King James actually says the way of the transgressor is hard. And that simply makes sense. If you're going to transgress, remember transgress is different than sin. It is sin, but it's different. To transgress is to sin having already been instructed not to, and you know what you're doing. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, so that, their way is hard because they're rebellious and hard-headed. Then like our parents used to say, if you make your bed hard, some of y'all had good parents. Amen. All right. <laughs> that was my aunt over there too. So we come from the same place. We know. Yeah. You make your bed hard. You're lying. All right. Verse uh, 16. Verse 16 says, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. Very simple verse. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this one, but I love the word prudent. It means one who is shrewd or crafty. And of course, those can be used both ways, sensible. Um, but what it really implies is for the prudent man, um, he acts with knowledge in the sense that he is going to be very shrewd. Um, in how he conducts business and makes decisions. He's going to do it with some kind of knowledge and wisdom so that he can be productive and effective. And that is, Christian, what we have been called to do. Some people think the walk of faith is just taking a bunch of chances and just, you know, you know, blindfolded. You know, yeah, faith does require us to walk by faith, not by sight. There are times when we have to do that. Amen. Right. But generally speaking, like every decision is not a big faith decision, but generally most of your decisions, God is going to give you, if you allow him, wisdom 
to make it. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally or freely. And that's the way he likes to operate. Hey, you need wisdom? Then you need to, you need to step aside and talk to me about it. We need to have some prayer. You need to have conversation with God and seek him because he's giving wisdom out. You know, like, you know, it, it ain't hard to find. God ain't hiding it from us. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, it's freedom. Like, hey, how did you succeed in that stuff, man? God is giving out wisdom around the corner. You better go get some. You know, it's like, where'd you get? Anyway, yeah, go spend time with him. He's speaking wisdom. And he's giving it to us so that we can make good decisions because we've been called to use our intellect as believers and apply the word of God. And especially in the dark times that we're currently living in. And Christians are learning to do this more and more and more. But he says here, but the fool lays open his folly. In other words, because he doesn't act with the wisdom of God, he doesn't make decisions according to the wisdom of God. His folly is laid wide open for all to see. I like how um, Bridges says it. He says, lacking this prudence, a fool exposes his folly. He pours out his wrath, his vanity. He exposes his thoughtlessness and exercises no judgment. And so the believer has been called to operate according to the wisdom that is given to us by the word of God. We are his children. We should act like we, we've been taught some stuff, you know? Like um, I, the other thing the older folks used to tell us when they would send us places is you better act like, you know, where you're from. In other words, you better act like we've taught you something when you go out, okay? Um, verse, uh, that was 16, verse 17. Verse 17 is a beautiful verse. I want to camp out for a moment there. Notice it says, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings health. It's interesting because um, t on the surface, it, it would seem that the messenger and the ambassador have pretty much the same role. Um, Solomon, in his wisdom, chose to use two different Hebrew words, though, one for, for, for the for the uh, messenger and one for the ambassador, which makes sense because in the English, we would think about it as an a, a messenger, excuse me, being less than an ambassador. In other words, any old wicked man can deliver a message. All he has to do is repeat what the master told him. It's simple, it's simple to do. Just repeat it. He didn't have to have any skill to do that. Where is the, the ambassador, on the other hand, has the authority to speak on behalf of his or her master. Um, the ambassador has an understanding of the heart and the motives and the agenda of his or her master and therefore has the ability and the authority to advocate and negotiate on behalf of the master. And so we see it differently. And I think the Holy Spirit is trying to get us to, to kind of grasp the heart of what's going on here because um, a lot of times the messenger, if we have the messenger mentality, I'll call it, um, we, we, we hear people say sometimes, well, hey, I'm just the messenger. And we, you may have said it before, which means that you're separating yourself from any responsibility of the thing. Hey, I'm just the messenger. Don't, you know, I ain't, I don't shoot the messenger. It ain't my responsibility. It's on the master. I'm just telling you what was said. And we do that. In fact, I did that recently, very recently, and the Holy Spirit convicted me. He says, you're not a messenger, you're an ambassador. I did it this way. There are some people in our congregation that, that don't like Proverbs 13, verse 24, where it says, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. So they don't like that. And they came to talk to me about it. And, and I had the nerve to say, well, hey, I'm just the messenger. And the Lord was like, no, you're not. You're an ambassador. Whoa, Zane, what do you mean? Well, remember that New Testament saints, we know this. Second Corinthians 5.20 says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was, were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul said to the Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20, he says, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Whoa, God convicted me. I'm not just a messenger. I am an ambassador. I have been 
filled with the, the spirit of God. I've been given the word of God. And it's, it's, as believers, we are more than just messengers. We have the heart of God. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. He's pleading with the world through us. Therefore, there's a bit more involved for us than just, you know, robotically uh, uh, repeating a message. Now, this is important. It's important that Christians get this because in everything we do, we are ambassadors. We are from a different place. Like we are of a different city, according to Philippians chapter, chapter four, the city of heaven. Amen. And, and so therefore we represent the place where we're from. And so you can begin to, to see how this works out even tomorrow when you go to work or if you go to school. In other words, it's easy as an employee to have the messenger mentality and say, well, look, you know, I'm going to do the bare minimum because it ain't mine. No way. I don't bear no responsibility for it. I'm just going to do what little bit I'm supposed to do and get by and then I'm done. You know, whereas the, 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 the ambassador who belongs to Christ is going to say, no, I'm going to do what is best for my company and what benefits them because that's what's important for me. Because if I do it that way, then I've done the right thing by my master, who, by the way, is not the boss. So when you go to work tomorrow, you don't if you go to work to work for the boss, then you're probably going to end up with the messenger mentality. But if you're going to work tomorrow as an ambassador of Christ, then you recognize Christ is my master. And therefore, my boss and my company are benefactors of the fact that I'm a Christian. So they're going to get the best work done the, in the best way. And, and it's going to be very effective, not because of them in and of themselves, but because of who I am and who I belong to. And, and that's when um, it really becomes the life here, because the verse says that a wicked messenger falls into trouble but a faithful ambassador brings help. And so therefore you bring help in the fact that not only are you blessing your master who is Christ, but those who are there around you are being blessed in the very way that you are conducting yourself even as an employee. But then there's even a deeper, a deeper meaning for us as believers when we really begin to think about what the verses are implying. Well, if we're ambassadors of Christ, then, then as an ambassador, the most important function I have in representing my king, the city I'm from, and, 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 and all of that is that I bring forth the message, the word of God, the gospel, the right way. And I, and I display it even in how I live my life and how I do my work. And so therefore, it becomes extremely important when we handle God's word in the times we live in that we, we bring all of it in its entirety the way God meant for us to. Now, that's real important today because it's becoming very hard in the environment that we're living in as Christians to do that. And remember, there are two things that's coming. There's a, there's a persecution coming, according to Scripture, and an apostasy coming, according to Scripture. And both have started. And so now it's getting weird. One of the most popular mega church personalities recently tweeted, the Christian faith does not rise and fall on the accuracy of the 66 ancient documents of, of 66 ancient documents. He tweeted, he says it rises and falls on the identity of a single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. Now that almost sounds spiritual at the end, but it's very wrong. And I'll tell you who it is. It's Andy Stanley, who says a lot of wrong things. But another thing Andy said, he said this. He says, um, if I can find it here in my quote. Yeah, he announced that Christians need to unhitch the Old Testament from their understanding of faith. Um, and then you can go and read all. He's, he's really off on a lot of things. That one he said a few years back. So these are some of the things that we're hearing from some of the most popular uh, mega church personalities who are impersonating Bible teachers in the times that we live in. And you know what? We have a new church here in the sense of a lot of you are new within the last two years. And I want to make this real clear. I want to, I want to be real clear because I think this is, this is me pleading for your life in a sense and those who you will impact. These statements are so wrong because what this, this man has done is misrepresented God and the Bible and he is setting people up to be potentially misled in many ways, okay? How important is it as an ambassador of Christ that I give the word in its entirety the right way? Well, I'm gonna tell you, and, and how important is the Old Testament to that process? 
Can I unhitch the Old Testament from my faith? It does the, do the 66 books matter? Absolutely. And I'm going to give it to you this way. The first page of the New Testament, which is Matthew chapter 1, gives us the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Joseph, Mary's husband. And then, of course, Luke gives us the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Mary. Y'all know this, right? Why is that important? Well, it's important because I need that genealogy in order to establish whether Jesus of Nazareth is actually the Messiah or not. And here's why I say that, because what we know from the Old Testament scripture is that that the Messiah, when he shows up, must be of the tribe of Judah and of the lineage of David. So therefore, if Jesus of Nazareth had came and he had said that he was of the tribe of Reuben or Issachar and then he did miracles, he wouldn't qualify to be the Messiah, even though he had done those miracles. You understand what I'm saying? Because there is one coming who's going to do miracles, but he is the, 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 the lawless one, the man of sin, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians. Are you following me? Yeah. So therefore, because we have the Old Testament, we then have a means by which we can gauge what the New Testament is doing and what's going on as we move into the New Testament. You see, it's important that we know these things and we understand these things. In fact, let me give it to you from Jesus' own words. Y'all bear with me for a moment. Jesus said, in, is that okay? Okay, Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, he said this, you search the scripture, talking to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Well, what scriptures is Jesus talking about? Well, he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, because the New Testament hadn't been written during this time, okay? You understand that, make perfect sense. So Jesus is saying, hey, the Old Testament scriptures are those which testify of me. In Luke's gospel, chapter 24, Jesus says it this way, or the account goes this way on the road to Emmaus. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses, which is the first five books of the Old Testament and all the prophets. So basically you have the Old Testament there. He expounded to them all the scriptures uh, in all the scriptures, the things concerning what himself. And then later on in that same chapter, verse 32, the two guys that were on the road with him speaking, it says, and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn with us while he talked with us on the road and while he noticed opened the scriptures to us. So Jesus opened the Old Testament scriptures to these guys and used those scriptures to, to, to reveal to them that Messiah would come but have to suffer. Hebrews 10, 7, speaking of Jesus, it says, um, then I said, behold, I come uh, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do your will. Of course, we understand that. And Jesus quotes the Old Testament throughout. So therefore, we need the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, don't we? Now, what am I saying to you? Because the times we live in are getting very weird. And I'm saying to you, listen, that we absolutely must be grounded in God's word that we are not led astray. Because God's word is a measuring stick by which we can measure and gauge everything that we are hearing, whether it is so or not. Pastor David taught when I was out a few weeks back in, uh, in the book of Acts where he talked about the Bereans. Anybody remember that? Um, Paul says, hey, these guys are more noble minded because they search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so or not. It didn't matter if it was coming out of the mouth of the Apostle Paul. They searched the scripture because the scripture is that by which we know truth. Amen? Not by a personality, not by a man, not by a denomination or anything else. In fact, Paul says, even if an angel show up from heaven and he preaches a gospel that is different than that which we've already received, then let him be anathema. It is so important that we be grounded, we are grounded in scripture. Extremely important. And so I love this. And so then he says here in back in verse 17, a wicked messenger falls into trouble. But a faithful ambassador brings health. A faithful ambassador is going to be careful to make sure that that which has been given has been communicated the right way 
with the right heart and even with the tone so that we can have what we need because otherwise we can fall into trouble. And this is why Paul wrote over in Ephesians that, that, he, that we don't need to be like those who are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that blow through, but that we would be grounded and, and mature and grow up. Does that make sense? And so this is very important that we understand this. And I wanted to point that out because we live in times where there's a lot of crazy things that are coming forth, but we need to be grounded in God's word because it doesn't matter what we see and more so it matters what, what has been given to us already. God says heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle from the word will by any means pass away or go unfulfilled. And we can judge everything we see according to the word of God. Verse 18 says, poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. And I love this verse because it speaks of just the heart that we should have as people, especially within a body of believers, because Christians have not been called to be isolated or be separated from one another, but to be a part of the body. We're one body, but many members. And so what that means is that, you know, we are going to receive instruction and even correction from one another, doesn't it? And we should have a heart to do so that so that we can be able to grow. And so it says here, poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. A man who doesn't want to hear anything from anybody else or someone who can't learn anything new because they're unwilling to hear uh, from somebody else. But he who regards the rebuke will be honored. I love that because the Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a friend, doesn't it? Y'all heard that? Um, and that iron sharpens iron. And so in, in, in a lot of ways, what happens is as we fellowship one with another, we're able to pour into one another and we learn from one another and we grow in that way. It's something that God has designed. I want to cover some ground. Verse 19, I'm going to move a little bit. A desire accomplishes sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Very simple. We know that you got your projects and, and, and things that you're working towards. And when those things are accomplished, they are a blessing. It is sweet to the soul that we that something's been accomplished. But somehow Solomon put these two contrast, this, this contrast together based upon his observation. So the desire, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. But it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. They, they, can't, they can't move away from that which is evil. And, and because they can't do it, maybe the implication is they don't accomplish the desires of their heart. Um, it, it, it doesn't work out for them because they, they can't hear the rebuke. They can't receive the instruction. They can't move away. That could be the implication there. Verse 20. Verse 20 is a beautiful verse. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. We know that the New Testament equivalent is in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, where it says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And so therefore, what it seems to be implying for the body of believers is that who you spend your time in fellowship with will actually have an influence on you. Now, we find that out pretty early on in our walk as believers, because most of us, when we get saved, we end up, the Holy Spirit begins to disrupt our lives and, 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 and changes our friend group a little bit. Anybody experienced that but me? And you begin to realize, man, I can't, I can't enjoy walking with my old companions who are not walking with the Lord anymore because something's happened in me and what they're doing, I don't enjoy anymore. And, and it's, it becomes this separation like oil and water that begins to happen. Either you're going to get so radically saved that you end up impacting them and they get saved too. Or God is going to somehow separate you from them because um, he can't grow you when you're still attached to non-believers who are still living a life of sin. You follow me? Now, he may send you back as a messenger. But you can't find your fellowship there. You can't grow there. And so the verse is wonderful. He who walks with wise men will be wise. The influence will rub off. And that's amazing. And it, it speaks of something. You should select those who you fellowship with or who you spend time with wisely because you're going to learn from one another. And this is just a, something that we've all experienced. We know to be truth. It says the companions of fools will be destroyed. 
because the fools are heading to destruction. And if you're hanging out with them, that's where you're going to. That's the destination. <laughs> it's very simple. That, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? All right, verse 21. We're going to wrap up the chapter. We've got to move swiftly. Um, evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. Very simple. It's one of those reaping what you sows verse. Um, it's hard to see sometimes or understand, but evil actually does pursue the sinners because they've given themselves over to evil and it's going to catch up with them. And if you, there's another scripture that says, if you slow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, then of the spirit, you'll reap, reap life. These are just things that are true in the word of God. Verse 22, y'all doing okay? Yes. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. A great contrast. Um, but I got to say this, this verse, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. We've already covered it, but I want to remind you, one of the things that we hear people say sometimes is I'm spending my children's inheritance. You ever heard people say that? I've even heard that from the pulpit before, um, kind of jokingly. I have to say there's something wrong with that concept and that mentality. Um, only a fool would say that and mean it um, because a good man, a man who loves the Lord, he begins to realize that, you know, I'm looking at this generation and the next one behind me, they're mine and the world is getting crazy and I want to do something. I can't take anything with me. I want to begin to do something to prepare the way that they would be able to have what they need, especially in the times we live in now. Um, if, you, if you look ahead, man, it doesn't look too good. And I want to make sure that, hey, if I can do anything at a certain age, it's time to start looking at how I can prepare for the ones who's coming behind me. And, and, the, and the greatest inheritance you can give them is how to, how to find your salvation in Jesus Christ and him only because that's given them eternity. Amen. Now, this is what a good man begins to learn and begins to realize that, let, hey, let me not consume everything. Let me begin to find ways to impact and even set up the, the, my, my grandchildren, the verse says. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. And this is what works out. In other words, the wealth of sinners somehow always ends up in the hands of the righteous. Verse 23, I'm going to try to wrap up. Um, now, verse 23, I got to camp for a moment. <laughs> Just a moment. Because it's important. Look at it really carefully. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor. And, he, and it says here, and for lack of justice, there is waste. What does that verse mean? Here's what it means. The poor man evidently owns at least some property. Okay, you catch that? You catch that? So much food is in his fallow ground, but because of injustice, it goes to waste. Why? He doesn't have the resources necessarily, evidently, to, to plow, to plant, or to harvest, but he's got the ground. But it, so he could, he could have a living, but there's injustice going on, and so something's being withheld that actually could, could be of help. Now, most of the time in, in rural communities of real farmers, not big, big farmers, you know what I'm saying, but where people still farm, they help each other. It's just all the way, I've always seen this back in the day when we would, when you had a big harvest to get done or you were killing a bunch of hogs, the neighbors would come help out and then we shared everything because they showed up and did work too. Does that make sense? Okay. And so what it's implying is, well, well, there's injustice, which is causing the poverty. Now, this is part of the world system, by the way, that we, we, we recognize and so here's what's going on. I was flying over Michigan a few weeks ago and I was looking at all the fertile ground that was down below. Like, man, Michigan, number one, is, is, is pretty empty and then has a ton of fertile ground. And then when I was driving through and I saw some of the gardens, the dirt was turned over. It was that rich, dark. I was like, man, I love to put some tomatoes in that. And I'm like, <laughs> man, look at this. Then I, but then I imagine in Detroit, there's poverty. You know what I'm saying? And so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you got to think about it like this. If you fly anywhere in the world and you look at you look at how much empty land there is and then in cities, there's poverty. OK. And then they tell you that, well, it, the poverty is because of the population growth. But that's a lie, because if you really were to do the math, 
The 7 billion people on this planet are probably using 10% of the land. Um, the problem is injustice. If man can't control it and make money off of it, they have no intention of helping the, po the poor. The re look, do you think God is dumb? <laughs> do y'all think God is wise? Yes. He created the earth, right? Yes. Okay. So do you think God would not create an earth that's sustainable? Is he not, does he, maybe God didn't understand what sustainable meant back then. <laughs> do you not think God could, would not create a sustainable earth? Yes, he would, wouldn't he? Do you think God would create an earth that's not big enough to handle the population growth? That he knew would come in the end because he's the one that tells us about the end? Of course he would, right? So God would plan for all of those things. Therefore, God created a sustainable earth that's big enough to, to house all of the population that could ever grow on it and all the resources are already here. That's the reality of it because God is wise. So therefore, man can't, we couldn't destroy the earth if we tried and we can't deplete the resources. Man is wicked and he's sinful because of injustice, there's poverty. And so that's the reality, y'all. And we live in a time, remember I told you that verse in Revelation 18 where, where you hear that voice says, come out from her, my people, because she's about to be judged. Speaking of the world system, Mystery Babylon, y'all remember that? Yeah. And so as Christians, we got to begin to think, well, let, Lord, give us wisdom so that we can begin to do things that provide for not only our families, but for our greater church families so that we are able to function the way God would have us to function, not just according to the way a bunch of lying politicians and, el and elites are telling us, um, because it's all a lie. You know, the earth ain't about to, 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 to go into some global warming heart attack that they're talking about. The only global warming that's coming is the one Peter talked about when God judges the earth, that it will burn with a fervent heat because God will bring judgment. Verse 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now, I, I, do, I do understand that some of you maybe have had bad experiences with the parents who have been abusive. I understand that. Um, and that's unfortunate if that's what you have experienced because nobody should ever spank a child out of anger, right? We understand that. However, God is the one who says you should spank your child. And God says you should do it promptly. And do you know, I was thinking about promptly. Promptly means more than just immediately after they do the bad thing. Promptly means in the early years when they are designed to, to learn from the spanking the right way. Okay, y'all, that's, that's really when we need to do it. Because if you wait until they're 15 or even 10, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, you miss your opportunity. So to discipline promptly. And if you remember my little bucket of tools that I, I displayed for the parents a few weeks ago. Most of those tools, listen, no, this, is, this is the thing you need to know. Most of those tools made more noise than, do, than and they didn't really do any damage. Like the little 12-inch ruler I had, that thing is so wonderful. It's a little thin piece of wood. And when you pop it, it, it makes enough noise to make the kids say, I don't want that. And it, it, but it doesn't, it doesn't even break the skin. It doesn't damage. But it's, it's designed for a little bit on the butt or the hand to cause them to realize. And here's what you do. You can, you can say to them, didn't I tell you not to do that? And we talked about this, right? Yes, but you did it anyway. Yes, after they've done it a few times. And then they realize, the kid then realizes that they're bringing the spanking on themselves. It's not mom and dad. And they learn from that. And you need to understand that because this is what scripture says. And God designed the child in, in every way. Okay. Psychology will tell you that you're going to hurt their psyche. So you have to choose whether you want to listen to God or psychology. But the Bible says that this, you should do this thing. Um, and so this is something that you have to go before the Lord. And if you don't quite know how you should, it's not about hurting the child and it's not about yelling, but it is about, it is about setting some boundaries and then teaching them. Because here's the thing. If you are letting your child do something five and ten times and, and you keep telling them five and ten times, what you're doing is teaching them to be disobedient because you never put a consequence on it over and over and over. You tell them not to do it. You tell them, I told you not to do it. Stop doing that. And you just talking and talking and they ain't even listening no more. They done tune you out like the Charlie, Gr Charlie Brown because there's no consequences. So it's just want, 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 want. 
they ain't gonna do nothing. Why should I listen, right? You know, so so then you looking silly in front of everybody else because your kids ain't listening to you because you tra- you train them not to listen to you. But if you if you after you say it a few times, you say, okay, come over here and you tear their butt up real quick. They're gonna learn. Oh snap, Mama meant that. I ain't doing it no more. And especially with the little ruler, which makes more noise and does anything else, you know. Um, now, the problem, though, is if you don't like verse 24, so you want to basically take this out of the chapter, this one verse you want to take out, well, then you're training yourself how to live on bad theology. Because you can't, you can't pick and choose from the scripture what you want to believe in practice and what you don't want to believe in practice. That's very bad theology, and that's not what we've been called to. We don't even have the right to do that because we didn't write the word, and the kids ain't ours, they're his. So then as a steward, you don't have the right to parent, to make the decision as a Christian parent not to spank your child. Now, you can because we can sin, but but is it a sin then to to constantly train my child to be disobedient because I'm never going to actually spank them. I'm going to try to time out. You know what time out used to do for me? Time out would give me enough time to figure out how to not get caught the next time. That's what time out would do. Time out because I'm a thinker. I'm either going to negotiate or think and I'm going to come up with a new plan. So while I'm in time out, I'm coming up with a new plan. But when you spank them, the crying kind of like bleeds it all out. Like, I'm done with it. I don't want it no more. You know, I don't, I, I, you know it drains out and you, you, you just like, you know, and then the parent and the child. You know, it's a wonderful thing when your child finishes crying and you're making up. And they're, and they're like, I'm sorry I did that. I, I know. And I don't want to hurt. I don't want to spank you. I don't like spanking you. Because you not do that again so I don't have to spank you because I don't like it. Literally, that's the kind of conversations you end up with, having with your child and you're making up and you're happy and everybody's happy because you did what God said. So you can take this out of your Bible if you like. It might be sin, though, to do so. I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. In verse 25 says, the righteous eats, the, eats to the satisfying of his soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. Very simple verse. No explanation needed. God's word is complete in, in the way we've received it. So we're way over time. Let's pray. Thank you for, for being here this morning. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for allowing us to feast on your word, Lord God. Be with us as we prepare to leave this place. Lord, I pray that you would protect that which is sown, that you would sort it out the way you would have it to fall in our hearts. Um, I pray for each family, uh, each married couple here and each single person here this morning, that you would go before us this week and give us all that we need, Lord, all of the, all of the uh, wisdom and discernment, that you would use our lives in a very, very powerful way, Lord, to reach those who don't know you. We love you. We thank you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing.